You know, last week we talked about the fact that God is indeed a trustworthy God. And, and this morning, I want us to think about when we trust God or how we're trusting God and how it impacts our lives. And I want us to use the book of Daniel as our starting point, and I want us to look at four different illustrations out of the first six chapters of Daniel that will help us understand when we trust God, we can truly depend on God. Now, uh, I know when we go back to Daniel, some people will go, well, is Daniel a real person? Yes, Daniel was a real person. Is Daniel a real story written by a real man? Yes, it is. And I believe it's written actually by Daniel. I know that there are some modern scholars who say differently, but you know, for millennia, people said Daniel was the author of Daniel. And I know that there are some linguistic issues and all that type of thing. If you go and you look at stuff, and people will say, well, based on these linguistics and all these different things, Daniel couldn't have written Daniel. Well, what those people don't tell you in the modern theology is that there are more problems created by their modern approach and their modern date than were solved. And so there are issues in Daniel that were unknown to the later date. There are languages in Daniel that, quote, didn't exist during the time of Daniel that some people would put to over here. But the reality is, is archaeology has cover, uncovered the fact that those language skills that are demonstrated in Daniel are actually part of that period. So, you know, I'm going to go with the fact that Daniel is the author of Daniel and that what we hear from Daniel is a testimony of God's ability, a testimony of God's greatness. Now, I hesitate to call them stories because... Many times when we talk about stories in the Bible, the story of Noah, uh, especially when we're talking to children, sometimes we'll sit there and we'll talk about, let me tell you the story of the farmer and the pigs and the cows and all the sheep and oxen and everything else. And, you know, let's tell you the story of the three bears. Let's tell you the story of Goldilocks and all the different things about stories. And then let's tell you the story of Noah. And let's tell you the story of Daniel. Those aren't even two. Those are two totally different things. The Bible is not a book of fairy tale. The Bible is a book of accurate, real stories that we can understand as testimony to the truth of God. And so when we look at these stories from Daniel, I want us to look at them as the testimony of God's greatness, the testimony of God's ability, the testimony of God's ability to move. So, we find Daniel. I want us to look at Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. This is later in Daniel's life. And it says, when... Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house, now in his roof chamber, when he had his windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. What I want us to do as we, as we march up to this moment, we're going to start much earlier, but we're going to march up to this moment. And when we get to that moment, I want us to understand just the amazing faithfulness of God, the amazing ability for us to trust God fully in our life. So I want us to understand you and I, our Christian walk is fueled by faith. It's fueled by our trust in God. If we do not truly trust God with all of our life, then there are things we hold back. There are things we won't do. Accomplishments we'll never gain. Peace that we'll never experience. Joy that will be something that we will miss out on. 
But when we place our trust fully in God, we see that there's a dynamic that begins to release in our life, that we look at everything from different perspectives. When we look at it, you may, Paul in the New Testament would say, rejoice in all things. And we go, how can we do that? Paul fully trusted God. He wasn't concerned about his circumstances around him to drive his faith. Daniel and his friends were the same. They didn't worry about the circumstances around them. They didn't worry about the opposition. They didn't worry about the threats. They placed their trust in God and it changed their perspective on absolutely everything. So if you want your life perspective to be changed, if you want everything to be changed about you, then place your trust fully in God and He will help you through this journey and help you see some amazing things. And so what I want us to look at are four illustrations that we'll see. The first one is found in Daniel, the first chapter. We've got in the first chapter of Daniel, it's going to talk about we need to trust God when we are called to stand by our convictions. What are your convictions? You know, I've found that your conviction and my conviction may be a little different, but the issue is if God gives you your conviction, stand on that conviction. No matter what I say, no matter what someone else says. And what we come up to here is we've got Daniel and his friends are now in captivity. They're about 17 to 18 years of age, somewhere around that, that area. They're, they've been seen as people who are, are potential leaders. They've got potential leadership qualities that have been spotted. They are being prepared for leadership positions. And some of these leadership positions are quite major that they could potentially get into. Uh, and there's a time of preparation. And, and during this time of preparation, they're told what to eat. They're told what to study. They're ta taught a new language. They're given new names. As a matter of fact, their, their names somewhat match their older name. But basically, it switches the emphasis away from the Yahweh God that they worship to another God. So, uh, you know, where one of them is fearful of God, the other one may be fearful of the moon God. You know, so you've got these name changes that happen. And, and so they're totally being integrated into this new society, into this new world. And there's a, a diet that is different than what Daniel was convicted of. And so as as they were bringing the king's ordered food and the king's ordered wine, Daniel approaches his groomer and says, I, I don't want that. So in Daniel, the first chapter, verse 8, it says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. So Daniel has a conviction about what he's supposed to eat, what he's supposed to drink. Now, some people will go back in today's world, right, right now we do this. Uh, some people jump back in there and say, I told you, Daniel's a vegetarian, Van Daniel's a vegan. And, and, you know, folks, that's not what Daniel is at all. This has nothing to do with being a vegan or nothing to do with being a vegetarian. It has everything to do with being a person under the conviction of God within his element of faith to follow what God was teaching him at the moment. Because think about this, Daniel's a Jew. If a Jew is going to practice his faith the way the Bible tells him to, he cannot be a vegan and he cannot be a vegetarian. There are parts of his faith journey 
that will demand that that not the case. So that's not what the Bible's pointing out here. And some people get really, really zeroed in on that. What I want you to understand is Daniel is under conviction by God to stand firm on a particular conviction at a particular time. So, yes, he's not going to eat meat at this particular time. He's not going to drink wine at this particular time. He's going to stand firm with what God has placed in his heart. And you see, what, what I found sometimes is sometimes other believers don't even understand the conviction that God has placed on your heart. But stand there. Stand firm. He, he stands firm and he begins to talk about it. And it's not just Daniel, but Daniel seems to be a ringleader for a group of four. And Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego are the names we know the other three most commonly by. But that's not their names. Their names are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These young men, all of them were in agreement with Daniel. All of them were standing with Daniel. All of them wanted to do the same thing. And so, you know, how does that work out? The man over the food said, hey, look, if, if I follow your suggestion, I can lose my head. So God gives Daniel wisdom and, and just wisdom at, at the age of 17 or 18, he goes to him and says, okay, give me 10 days. That's all I need, 10 days. Feed me this way for 10 days, and then you can compare the four of us with everybody else, and then you can determine whether we can remain on this diet or whether we have to go over to the other. If, if we're not okay at that point, we will submit to this other. And 10 days later, they come back, and they look at Daniel and the others, and they see they're actually better fit, better off than the others. And they say, that's okay. You can do that. You know, sometimes standing by our convictions is hard. Jeremiah had a call to, to preach a message that he stood by his entire life and the vast majority of people, almost 100% of the people who heard Jeremiah, never followed the teaching of Jeremiah. Never. But he continued to teach. He continued to preach. He continued to, to share. You've got other examples such as Esther. Esther was uh, the queen now what's interesting is in her world, the queen could not approach the king, her husband, and say something to him unless she was called on to do so. Her people were at risk of being destroyed. And Mordecai calls on her and says, look, the reason why you're queen, who knows, it may be for a moment like this, a time like this. So she stands on the conviction of the moment, and she says, Go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I, my maidens, also will fast in the same way. And thus, I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. That's a serious commitment, isn't it? You and I need to understand that there are times in our life when we have convictions that no one else is going to be standing with us or we may have a small group that stands with us but ultimately our decision is going to impact the lives of so many other people Daniel's commitment to his conviction also helped his friends Daniel's commitment to his position 
eventually allowed others to see him as someone who could be trusted, someone who could be uh, depended on, and someone who would stand firm. Let me tell you, when you and I don't stand on our convictions, people notice also. So I want you to understand, God will be with you when a conviction is placed on your heart and you stand on it. Trust Him because He is trustworthy. And we've looked at that and God sees it through. The second area I want us to see is we need to trust God when we don't have all the information. The example is out of the second chapter. And when we're in that, the king has been having some issues. He's, he's, got, he's got a secret in his mind. He's got a dream that he's had. He's had some, some things he needs to explain. And he's tired of everybody giving him just whatever answer he needs. So basically, this was his version of fake news in his day. Because basically what would happen is the wise men would hear something from the king. They would figure out how the king wanted it spun so that it sounds good to the ears of the king. And then they would give him what he wanted to hear. And he said, look, I've got something going on in my mind. And, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. If you are truly men of God, if you are truly wise men, then what's going to happen is you're going to tell me what's going on. And you're going to let me know what's going on in my mind. And you're going to give me the interpretation without me ever saying anything else to you. Or I'm going to have your lives destroyed. And I'm going to have your families destroyed. And I'm going to have your houses turned into mass rubble. Whoa! That's a kind of horrifying position, isn't it? Because... Nobody knows what's in the mind of another person. I know husbands, our wives sometimes say, I know what you're thinking. Let me tell you, there is no wife that knows what any husband is thinking. And there is no husband that knows what any wife is thinking. There is no way possible for me to know your thoughts unless you share your thoughts with me. That's why communication is so important, especially in a marriage situation. Daniel is here, and he's, he's realizing only God knows everything. Only God. And, and so... If I'm going to work out everything, it's going to have to be from God working in it. And so what happens is, is as they're moving along in this situation, uh, he, he, the, the wise men fail to reach any verdict on what God is, or what is being shared. And so the order actually goes out by the king's captain to destroy the wise men. And they come in to find Daniel. Matter of fact, the scripture says that they are looking to kill Daniel and his friends. And Daniel stops him and says, hold it, before you kill me, what's the urgency of this? And what is the issue of this? We don't even know what's going on. They weren't even part of the conversation. You know, sometimes we get caught up in things at, that we're not even a part of the original conversation. We're not part of the original issue. We don't know any of the information. And in the whole process, we're sitting here going, what are we doing? Where are we? We're just caught up in this. That's where Daniel is at this particular moment. He didn't even know what's going on. And so he gets a little bit of a, a reprieve here because he appeals to talk to the king and at least hear the king out. He then tells the king if he can have a little time, he'll be able to tell him what the interpretation is. The king gives him that. You know what Daniel does? He immediately goes back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and he says, Hey guys, I need your prayers. 
I need you to get on your knees. I need you to get it in, in, before God. I need you to ask God to help us and have compassion on us and allow His interpretation of what's in the mind of the king so that we can move forward in safety. Now, as they did in, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Let me tell you what. You don't know all circumstances. You don't know all issues. You can't have all the facts. It's impossible. But God has all the facts. God knows all the things. And you and I need to be a people who connect with God constantly so that we can learn from God. Because God looks and says, Hey Daniel, I'll take care of this request. I'll take care of the issue. Here is what the answer is. You and I need to know that. So he was able to go to the king, share what the information was, share what the interpretation was, and he saved not only his life and his four, three other friends' lives, but all the wise men's lives throughout the country. When we're facing issues, what do we do? In Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, it says, When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you will speak in your defense, or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. You and I need to trust God and understand that God is at work in our life even through these incidences. Paul was told, hey look Paul, or Jesus would later tell the disciples and and Paul would be a part of that same conversation later. But he would say, hey, look, they're going to persecute you. They're going to take you before the synagogues. They're going to take you before the prisons. They're going to take you to the governors. And they're going to take you to the kings. They're going to do all these things. And what's the purpose of it all? Listen to what it says. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. You and I, sometimes when we get persecution, we, what do we think about it? What we need to begin to do is say, God, we're trusting you in this moment that even though persecution is coming, even though situations are not what I expected, where in this are you giving me the opportunity to share my faith? I just finished reading again the book, The Hiding Place. I think every Christian should read the book Hiding Place. Every Christian. Corey Tin Boone. But I thought it was interesting. One of the stories in it that she shares is during the interrogation process of the prison, after days of being interrogated, her interrogator began to question her and ask her some questions and she just could not come up with any answers and so she started talking about the Bible. Eventually, her interrogator kept inviting her back to be interrogated, but his interrogation was on the Bible. What is God's Word saying about how I can have the kind of peace that I'm seeing in you? Listen, folks. God is up to something much bigger than just your life. God is much more involved and much more going on than just your world or my world. He's wanting His Word to get out there. So we need to trust in Him and place our trust in Him when we don't know all the information. Another thing is we need to trust God when everyone else does it and we don't. Now, have you ever heard that? But everybody else does. Yeah, they do. But you're not them. 
you're a child of God. You're a believer in the truth of God. You trust God fully with your life. You're not like everybody else. The illustration in this one is in chapter 3. When you find that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are there. And there's a group pressure to uh, bow down before an idol. Now, honestly, that idol was simply, uh, in some way, honoring the king. But you know, there's a big difference between honoring someone and worshiping someone. And they had turned it into an act of worship. It's okay for us to honor our president. It's never okay for us to worship our president. Never. He is not God. He isn't even close. And so when we look at it, this is the situation here. You had the king setting himself up as a person of worship. And when the people, you know, they were supposed to worship him. They were supposed to fall down and, and follow after him. And the scripture would talk about the fact that whenever a command would be given and the instruments would play, no matter where someone was in the land, they were to fall on the ground. They were to bow before the idol. And they were to worship or risk being thrown into the fiery furnace well most people around them did exactly that you know I'm, I'm sure you know these people were from the many of these I mean because there's thousands of Jewish believers in the area thousands that were taken into captivity They were brought up in the same idea. They were brought up with the same rules. They worshiped the same God. But yet many of those people probably thought, well, you know, I don't want to cause trouble. I don't want to be a problem. What does it hurt? What does it hurt to, to make this sacrifice? What does it hurt to, to go to this reading? What does it hurt to burn a few incense? What does it hurt because it's just honoring my family? And, and I, don't want to, I don't want to create a problem with my family. I don't want to create a problem with my government. I don't, want to, I don't want to be in a problem situation. Listen, God says, I don't want you to be in a problem situation either. And if you don't trust me, that's exactly where you are. And in the middle of all of this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the, the music starts, the worship starts, and they stand. They don't bow. Wow. When they're challenged on that, they're brought before the king, and the king basically gives them a second chance. You know, okay, guys, maybe you didn't understand the rule. Here's the rule. You bow or burn. That's the rule, okay? Maybe you misunderstood it, so here, here, that's what I want you to know. So uh, uh, what, what, what's your response going to be? So in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 and 17... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. Now this is their reply to the king. Listen. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Whoa! You're talking to the king and you're telling the king, you've just asked me a question and I'm saying, I don't even need to answer you here. What they're basically saying is we have already shown you by our commitment and our action that we are not going to worship you as a God. We're not going to worship your gods. It says, 
If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you set up. Now, the thing that always amazes me here is because many times people would be, I I'll worship you, I'll follow you, I'll, I'll, I'll walk with you, God, talking to God, if you protect me, and if you, if you walk with me, and if you show me that the path is going to be okay, and if you, you let me know that everything is going to be provided for, and my life is going to be good. That isn't what these guys say. They say, look, we'll willingly walk into the fire even if it means we will burn to a crisp. Because even in that moment, we will recognize that we love one God, we serve one God, we trust one God, and He is who we follow. And you know what? The king was not impressed with their answer. They were bound the furnace, I mean, he was so mad, he said, throw on the extra coal. Get that thing as hot as it's ever been. Make it so blazing hot that they won't even survive a minute. And literally, the men who were carrying them into the furnace to throw them into the furnace died as a result of the heat. And what happened? The Bible tells us that when... when he looks down into the furnace when it's cooled down enough that he can look down into the furnace. He says, hold it. What is going on? We threw three guys in the furnace, but there's four guys down there. And they're not bound like they were. They're free. And they're walking around. The word walking around here is a word of casually walking. Think about that. You're in the middle of a fiery furnace and you're casually walking. Oh, hi, how are you? You know, man, we'd be, I, I'd be trying to get out of there. But there was something there that was allowing them to feel a tremendous peace and comfort. And that was the presence of God Himself. They were brought out of the fire without even the smell of the fire on them. And Nebuchadnezzar had to acknowledge God is indeed God. You and I sometimes won't be rescued from the persecution. But we will be in the persecution when God gets the attention of those around us. Don't hesitate to follow God. The last thing I want us to see is we need to trust God when we are targeted and seem alone and defeated. The passage we started with in, in, in Daniel when we looked at chapter 6, verse 10, we saw Daniel sitting up on his rooftop praying to God. At that moment, Daniel was alone. We don't know what happened to his friends. We don't know if they died years earlier. Daniel is now 70 to 80 years old, somewhere like that. So a lot of time has passed. A lot of faithfulness is under the bridge. And as we, as we look, people know Daniel. They don't like Daniel. They don't like his faithfulness. They don't like his God. They don't like him. And so what they start doing is they say, we've got to figure out a way to destroy Daniel. We can't do it... I mean, he's, he's morally a great guy. We can't kill him on his morals. Religiously, he's a great guy. We can't kill him on his religion... Politically, he's 
a friend of the king and has the king's ear. The king really likes this guy. So we have to be careful where we are on this. So here, what we'll do. Listen, it says all the governors, all the commissioners, all the prefects, all the high officials, all the satraps consulted together to come up with a foolproof plan to destroy Daniel. They came up with a plan. Their idea was, King, you need honor. A different king, not Nebuchadnezzar anymore, Darius now. Different king, different time, different setting, different backgrounds. And so here it is. These men who pursued him to destroy him come to this place and they help the king establish a law. That is basically a law based off of ego. You deserve to be honored, king. You deserve it. You know, let's set aside a 30-day event in which everybody in the kingdom has to bow down and worship you, and no other god can be worshipped for 30 days, only 30 days, and, and that's it. Because they knew the only way they could get Daniel is to break him from his god. And they knew he wouldn't do that. They knew his conviction. They knew he wouldn't stop. And so they come into this situation and they pass the law. And here's one thing. This particular kingdom is not like the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. Because if Nebuchadnezzar would have passed this law, he could have just overridden the law. But this isn't the same kingdom, remember? This is the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Once a king signs a law into existence, it has to take place. It cannot be changed, not even by the king. So they wait several days, and they just want to make sure, because, you know, all right, Daniel's going to break this, and, and he, they had to wait long because he broke it the first day. But they waited several days so they could go, you know, consistently, systematically. Daniel knows about the law. Daniel knows, and he is violating the law. All of a sudden, it dawns on the king. Their whole target was Daniel. He liked Daniel. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that King Darius at that moment started looking for every possible way that he could to overturn the law or to prevent Daniel's death. When the king had done absolutely everything humanly possible to stop Daniel's execution, he finally just comes to a place and says, King, Art Daniel, the only hope you have is your God. Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. The king doesn't sleep that night. And the next morning, when he rushes to the lion's den, he's, he's calling out for Daniel. And Daniel, O oh king, live forever. I'm still here. God sent his angel last night. I rested fine. Wow. You know what, folks? Those aren't just stories. Those are testimonies of the real ability of God, of getting involved in our life, of changing the circumstances, of dealing with the situations, of giving us information, of changing everything around us, or sometimes not changing anything around us, but protecting us through it all. But it's all going to depend on you and I trusting God for that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance of every good deed. And then in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17, it says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. 
With God, all things are possible. Would you give God your life? Would you trust Him and follow Him with your life? This week, you're going to be challenged. There are going to be convictions that God are going, is going to ask you to stand on. There's going to be situations where you're not going to know the information. There's going to be threats from outside enemies. There's going to be situations where you feel like you're the only one standing. But whichever one of those, or maybe even all of those, you face this week, trust God. He will see you through. This morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He is inviting you to come, reside with Him, live in that level of trust, and walk with Him. And give yourself completely over to Him. So today, would you say yes to Jesus? And believers, today, would you say yes? I'll follow you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love, guidance, and direction in our life. Help us, Lord, to take these examples of the testimony of Daniel. Help us to apply the truths to our life so that we will follow you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul and strength. Bless us, Lord, as we walk with you this week. Strengthen us and encourage us. Allow us to live out our faith in Jesus' name. Amen.